In 1492, Christopher Columbus set sail on the famous voyage to the Americas that would earn him a place in history as the pioneer of a new age of exploration. The Western world was about to leave behind the Middle Ages and enter a new era of discovery. In Western art too, a new age was dawning. The end of the 15th century marks the beginning of one of the finest periods of European art. This is the story of that brief era called the Renaissance. The Renaissance is really the period when things certainly come together for art history. It's one of those moments we remember, like Impressionism, as being particularly important, because not only do we have patrons who are prepared to pay for art, but we have amazing artists who are prepared to produce the things which their patrons want them to do. I'm talking about figures like Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, Titian and Holbein, these great artists who worked for the famous princely and papal patrons of Europe in in the 15th and 16th centuries. This is Rome, the center of modern Italy. And of course, in ancient times, it was the center of the greatest empire that Europe had ever seen, the Roman Empire. Around 1500, the papacy was growing much stronger. Its wealth was increasing, and its popes became incredibly ambitious, both in terms of art and politics. Also at this time, through the rediscovery of classical literature, artists were beginning to be regarded as what we now call the genius. In other words, they had powers of a sort of divine frenzy that led them to be able to create at a level unheard of before in Gothic art. Artists such as Michelangelo, Bramante, and da Vinci launched into enormously ambitious projects, many of them funded and backed by people such as the Pope. The word Renaissance means literally rebirth. What is reborn, of course, is the classical world of Rome and Greece. Between the period of the end of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the Renaissance, uh, most thinking was developed around a theocratic point of view, uh, where uh, learning uh, or an understanding of the world was based upon uh, the idea of God's place in the world and how God informed the world and created uh, the world so that we were all made within God's image. But gradually, as if some of the philosophical ideas of the classical world became more widely uh, understood, an idea developed that the world could be seen through the eyes of humankind. What made the Renaissance different from the preceding period was the idea that man was in control of his world. He could operate not exactly on an equal level with God, but he could work harmoniously with nature. With man in the centre, these artists could look out upon the world and see it afresh and to create visions of the world that man had never seen before. They learned how to idealize the figure. They learned about nature in a way that was almost scientific. We have a move within the Renaissance, a rejection of the stiff formality, scholastic philosophies and dogmatism towards an experimental spirit. Um, if you like, an attempt to go out there, try things, see if they worked, to um, look at the world and play with the world. And so it was that artists such as Michelangelo and Raphael were drawn to Rome, where they spent the bulk of their artistic career, here in the Eternal City. This idea of rebirth was felt first not here in Rome, but 150 miles to the north in the Tuscan city of Florence. An attractive, prosperous city today Florence is famed the world over for its art galleries and museums, 
with hundreds of great works on display, created by artists who lived and worked here. The first of these great Florentine artists was Giotto, active around the beginning of the 14th century. It was early in the 15th century that Florentine artists collectively initiated what is now regarded as the early Renaissance. In an independent, outward-looking city, made wealthy by trade and commerce, a new fascination with the art and literature of the ancients began to develop. The discoveries and innovations of the artists of Florence soon began to spread throughout Italy, and eventually elsewhere in Europe. But throughout the 15th century, Florence retained its preeminence as an artistic center. It was into this culture that a teenage boy arrived around the mid-1460s. His family moved from a nearby Tuscan village where he was born. A precociously talented youth, he would take advantage of the opportunities for learning afforded by Florence and developed into one of the most admired and sought after artists of his time, Leonardo da Vinci. As a painter, Leonardo certainly didn't deserve his reputation. He was an innovator in all sorts of ways. And one of the significant things about his paintings is that he was moving from the very stiff, very formalized um, composition of paintings, which was current up to that point, to something much more fluid, much more evocative. Um, the use of colors and the way he painted the colors. All of this suggested a much more fluid experimental approach. From an early age, Leonardo demonstrated an insatiable appetite for study and the sheer breadth of his research can be seen in his surviving notebooks. He studied anatomy, astronomy, physics, geography, and engineering, amongst the other subjects that today are the preserve of single subject professionals. He created designs for flying machines 400 years before the Wright brothers took to the air. But Leonardo was first and foremost an artist who soaked up the technical advances in art taking place in his lifetime. His unfinished Adoration of the Magi, now on display in the city's Great Uffizi Gallery, displays his early mastery of the new science of perspective and his dramatically solid, authentically posed figures, all arranged in the satisfying pyramid design which had been pioneered by Botticelli in his Adoration of the Magi, also in the Uffizi. Leonardo's Adoration would remain unfinished, however, since 1482 would see the young artist leave Florence to enter the service of Ludovico, Duke of Milan, where he would remain for 18 years. He worked as the Duke's chief engineer and architect, whilst at the same time working on sculptures and paintings. He continued to indulge his powerful passion for research, most notably his study of nature and the human body. He's explorations into science, into, into anatomy, into flight, into all these kind of branches of learning showed the way in which man was perceived to be able to be in control of his environment and to be in control of nature. This can be seen in Leonardo's painting of the Last Supper which was regarded as a revolutionary work. <laughs> Leonardo's Last Supper was painted for the refectory of a monastery called Santa Maria delle Grazie, Santa Maria of the Graces in Milan. And it's a work which has been famed ever since the moment of its inception. People who were in Milan in the 15th century were commenting about its marvels. And it's really famous because it shows a very familiar subject in Christian iconography, the Last Supper. And this is the moment when Christ and his disciples are getting together before Christ is going to be betrayed by Judas. Up to that point, artists would have um, treated the Twelve Apostles as isolated individuals, and they would each have been formally painted in their own right. But what Leonardo did was grouped them into dynamic groupings of three, and these were arranged around the figure of Christ and framed the figure of Christ, so that the whole um, tenor of that painting, and, and it is truly a masterpiece, is um, a painting full of movement and full of life which had hitherto not really been apparent in paintings of the period. Here we see 
all of the apostles sitting having their meal off the same refectory tables that the monks themselves eat off. And even the tablecloth uh, was the same tablecloth. Um, it's known that Leonardo um, actually requested uh, uh, these items so that he could construct his image uh, on the same basis. It gives the monks the impression that they are having their meal at the same time that Christ uh, is having the Last Supper. I suppose the effect of it is heightened today by the fact that painting is in a parlous state of disrepair. It's in a complete mess because Leonardo, although he was a great painter, was not a great technician. He didn't know how to paint fresco, which is the medium which this painting is on, straight onto the wall of the refectory where the monks ate. So it's been disintegrating gradually for the past couple of hundred years. But although this is very sad for the painting, it gives it this misty quality, which when you're looking at it makes it look even more more evocative, romantic and emotional. So in a sense, the bad technique actually heightens the way the painting looks as an evocation of the Last Supper. Soon after the completion of the Last Supper, Leonardo was forced to leave Milan when it fell to the armies of the French, and he returned to Florence in 1500. By 1502, he'd found himself a new patron, the tyrannical Cesare Borgia, the Duke of Romagna, Working principally as the Duke's architect and engineer, Leonardo also continued working on several portraits, although only one of them has survived to the present day. Now on display in the Louvre, Paris, it captures Leonardo's memory of a haunting smile he once found on a Florentine woman of his time. The Mona Lisa is perhaps the most famous of Leonardo's paintings. It's, in fact, so famous, it um, appears in images throughout the world, possibly more than any other painting that's ever been produced. We're so used to seeing it in reproductions, on T-shirts, in ads, in anything, that we forget that actually it's a really, really tiny picture. It's very small. And who is it? That's the question that people always ask, because the lady in it has this famously enigmatic smile. The significance of the Mona Lisa as a milestone in, um, in the history of art is that it shows consummate skill in two techniques, two distinct techniques. The first one is called sfumato, and this is the infinitesimal grading of areas of colour into one another. And what this gives is a rather dewy picture, um, a smoke-filled scene, soft, um, without hard edges. And the second technique is called chiaroscuro, and this is the um, modelling of forms, the bringing of form onto the canvas by the use of light and shade, and the juxtaposition of light and shade to suggest solid form. Leonardo is very keen on these strange, romantic, ev evocative landscapes, and the back of the Mona Lisa, like many of his other paintings, has these strange mountains and sites not known to man, but which came out of Leonardo's imagination. He was amazingly fertile. He kept all these diaries and notebooks in which he'd write down any idea he had. And he saw himself not just as a painter, but as an inventor and an engineer and just a great thinker. And I think that comes across in paintings like the Mona Lisa, which are more than a painting. They really are about an attitude of mind or of thought. It's a way of seeing into Leonardo himself, really. The Mona Lisa, again, has a problem because in a sense it needs cleaning, uh, but it's rather regarded almost as too valuable a painting even to touch, so that uh, if, if it was cleaned uh, we perhaps would have a much more definitive view of how uh, he, he constructs the recession within the paintings and things like that. Um, but we now only have perhaps uh, a part of the image um, uh, because of this problem. By the time of the creation of the Mona Lisa, Leonardo was already a legend whose skills were sought by the great men of his age. Noblemen wanting portraits, civic leaders wanting advice on canal construction, generals wanting weapons.
Leonardo's fame and genius meant that he had no shortage of projects to turn his mind to. In 1505, for example, in Florence, he was asked to join a committee of artists to decide where to place a new statue created by a 28-year-old Florentine contemporary. The statue concerned would become one of the most famous sculptures ever, and its creator a celebrated model of the Renaissance notion of divine inspiration. It was none other than Michelangelo. Michelangelo is the second of the great Florentine artists of the High Renaissance, and quite different from Leonardo. Whereas Leonardo was placid, calm, easy to work with, Michelangelo, on the other hand, was difficult and tempestuous and had even proved to be too much for a pope. Born in 1475 to a well-connected family, as a youth he was briefly apprenticed to Domenico Ghirlandaio, an important fresco painter of his day. After leaving Ghirlandaio, the young Michelangelo moved into the palace of Lorenzo de' Medici, and its thriving intellectual environment, dominated by the study of classical culture. Like Leonardo, he studied anatomy extensively while learning about the mathematical system of proportions used in classical art. Concerned from an early age with the artistic task of representing the human figure, Michelangelo's first preference was for marble sculpture. Michelangelo saw the process of working with marble as a type of divinely inspired activity. We hear about Michelangelo attacking blocks of stone with nothing else to help him but his divinely inspired inspiration. However, other sources tell us that he actually worked painstakingly with his marble and he saw this process as a way of setting free a, a type of spirit that was trapped within the block of stone. Michelangelo was by far the greatest sculptor who ever lived. He lived for a full 87 years, um, and within that period, uh, he completely revolutionized the um, art of sculpture. By 1504, he'd completed the sculpture whose location would be decided by Leonardo and others. Like Donatello's St. George and the Dragon. David was another great hero of the Bible. Here, though, Michelangelo has used a much more classical style. He's made much greater study of anatomy and classical sculpture than Donatello was able to make. This is the High Renaissance style in which the idealization of the human figure is brought to its highest peak. Michelangelo has put this to great use in making one of the great symbols of the independence and heroic individual spirit of the Florentine Republic. In fact, when it was finished, it wasn't put on top of the cathedral as intended, but right here, down low, in front of the town hall. Ever since then, it's become a symbol of the Florentine Republic. If this sculpture symbolizes the Republic, it does so because it achieves a plane of superhuman grandeur. It does not ignore faults, but ennobles them, thus remaining accessible and monumental. Moreover, it conveys an eternal image of spiritual courage and physical energy without the need for a symbolic weapon. Notice the posture in particular is very classical. It's called contrapposto. One side carries the weight and is about action, the other side is relaxed and is about thought. In this sculpture, Michelangelo combines action and reflection in a single sculpture that is self-sufficient. Michelangelo's genius was now known throughout Italy and came to the attention of the new pope, Julius II, one of the greatest art patrons of the Renaissance. The Palace of the Vatican, Rome, is home to a priceless collection of books, manuscripts, and artworks from throughout history. It consists of a complex of buildings at the heart of which stands Michelangelo's dome as a sign of the authority of the Church of Rome. Before designing this dome, however, Michelangelo worked in the tall open hall designed by Sixtus IV for the conduct of papal ceremonies. This Sistine Chapel was to be the location of one of the most extraordinary feats in Western art history. 
By the early 16th century, its walls had already been painted by artists such as Perugino and the great Botticelli, but the ceiling remained blank. It was Julius who proposed that this ceiling should be painted by Michelangelo. And although Michelangelo thought of himself primarily as a sculptor, he was reluctantly persuaded to take on the new challenge. In four years of solitary work between 1508 and 1512, lying on scaffolding flat on his back, Michelangelo used the technique of frescoing, applying paint to wet plaster, to produce a masterpiece of crisply rendered muscular figures. The Sistine Chapel ceiling remains one of the more memorable creations in Western art, but remarkably, it was not the only momentous art being produced in the Papal Palace at the time. In 1509, Pope Julius commissioned another series of frescoes for a suite of rooms within the Vatican. To carry out the work, he chose a 26-year-old artist who had trained in Perugia. He is now regarded as the third great artist of the Florentine High Renaissance, Raffaello Santi, or Raphael. Raphael of Urbino was one of those very particular talents. He was, he was a contemporary of Michelangelo's and of Leonardo. I don't think any of the three of them really got on. They were all such big artists that they felt they were you know, crowding each other out. But Raphael was from Urbino, which was near Florence, but the real moment in his career came when he went to Florence at the turn of the 16th century, where he was able to see the work that Michelangelo and Leonardo were doing in the council hall in Florence. He was very much influenced by that. Raphael is often thought to be the pinnacle of all Renaissance artists in that he uh, combined all of the best parts of uh, the other famous Renaissance painters uh, without what was uh, uh, at one time considered their faults. Raphael's painting became, um, particularly in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, almost the icon uh, that artists uh, to, to aspire to. Raphael's greatest achievement within the Vatican can be seen within a room known as the Stanza della Segnatura. The subject matter for these frescoes was about the intellectual pursuit of man, such as theology, law, philosophy, a whole range of academic disciplines. This theme fitted in very well with the purpose of this room, which formed part of the suite of papal offices of Julius II. An important feature of this room was Raphael's School of Athens, whereby various philosophers exemplify their particular, their particular ideas and particular thoughts by their gestures and by their facial features. Frescoes such as this and others, such as the nymph Galatea, which can still be seen in Rome's Villa Farinese, would have been enough to secure him fame within his lifetime. But it is not for these that Raphael is best known, but for a series of paintings executed during his earlier period in Florence. Having arrived there at the age of 21, into an environment dominated by Leonardo and Michelangelo, he quickly produced a series of images of the Virgin Mary that have become a standard for such devotional work. A superb example of Raphael's Madonnas can be seen in the Uffizi in Florence. It's entitled The Madonna of the Goldfinch. The Madonna of the Goldfinch, this was painted shortly before he left for Rome in 1508. It's a triangular composition that allows Raphael to create uh, a completely um, stable, uh, unified composition. This painting was painted for a man called Lorenzo Nasi, who was a great familiar of Raphael's. And it's a little Madonna with 
Christ Child and St John the Baptist. And it's a beautiful composition. It's very, very sympathetic. The Madonna has a lovely, lovely face. It's in a gorgeous setting. It's something to look at, which you would gain a lot from each time. But we also forget that it's a religious image. And this painting really was meant to show an apocryphal, that is a made up moment from the Gospels, when the little baby John the Baptist was meant to have gone to baby Christ and asked him about the mystery of the Passion. And when he brought with him a goldfinch, which is a symbol of the Passion, and this painting with these two beautiful infants is meant to symbolise them both knowing that actually they're going to suffer horrific deaths for Christianity. So for people looking at the painting, they could appreciate the beauty of it and also the religious sentiment. So it had a twofold purpose. It's a very, almost a sweet sort of image. It's an image which has come down to us as a kind of totem, almost, of what uh, uh, pictures of the Madonna are. And um, Raphael was the painter who was able to uh, encapsulate this uh, most within his painting. Although Raphael's fame stemmed primarily from Madonnas such as this, and from his Vatican frescoes, he also executed several important oil paintings, notably of the two popes who patronized his work, Pope Julius II, whom he painted in 1511, and his successor as pontiff, Giovanni de' Medici, or Pope Leo X. But like his great Florentine contemporaries, Raphael's skills extended beyond painting, and in 1514 he was appointed chief architect of the new St. Peter's Basilica in Rome by Leo X. In addition, he took charge of the excavations of classical ruins taking place in Rome at this time. By 1520, Raphael was a major figure in Rome, on intimate and influential terms with the Pope and his court. Tragically, in that same year, Raphael died suddenly on his 37th birthday but having produced in his short lifetime some of the most memorable images of Western art. Raphael was the second of the great triumvirate of Florentine high Renaissance geniuses to die, the great Leonardo having died the previous year at the age of 67. By contrast, though, Michelangelo would survive for another 44 years, his greatest painting during this period taking place once more within the Sistine Chapel between 1536 and 1541. This was his large fresco for the altar wall. The Last Judgment, in fact, is uh, the most apocalyptic of all of his paintings. Um, so, so much so that when the painting was unveiled, um, uh, the Pope was supposed to be actually terrified of, of the image. Um, it was uh, far more uh, dramatic, far more uh, emotional than uh, he'd ever envisaged that it would be. Traditionally, Last Judgments were very iconic. They showed Christ in glory and him sending people down to hell or up to heaven, depending on whether they'd been good or bad in the life. But Michelangelo's painting is, has got much more movement in it. It's full of life. Things are happening all over the place. He puts in a scene from Dante's um, Divine Comedy, that's of Chiron, who was the ferryman bringing the souls of the damned over to hell. And that's actually from classical mythology, but Michelangelo incorporates it in The Last Judgment, which of course is in the centre of the papacy in Rome. And he also paints himself very curiously on the flayed skin of St. Bartholomew, a saint who'd been martyred most horribly by having his skin all cut off. And Michelangelo places himself there, which has been used as an example of what despair he might have been feeling when he was painting this Last Judgment, which he was very unhappy to be doing it. He was doing it as a great favour for the Pope. His mind had uh, very much darkened, his ideas had very much darkened, from the period 20 years previously when he was painting the ceiling. When we look at the ceiling, it's a very affirmative image. It creates this sense of the greatness of, of God and the universe that he created. Uh, but The Last Judgment is a, a painting uh, which underpins this notion of uh, the frailty of mankind and of how um, judgment will come to all of us. It 
was a commission which has lots of nudity in it. And after Michelangelo's death, there was a movement, the Reformation was hitting Italy. It was called the Contra Reformation. And a lot of the cardinals and people high up in the Catholic Church were not happy at all about the fact that there were all these naked men like Christ himself on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. So they sent other painters to paint them over with fig leaves. And these were just removed in the recent restoration. So now if you're in Rome, you can see the painting in its true glory and in the beautiful harmony of the blue and rose colours that Michelangelo originally designed. Michelangelo continued to produce unrivaled work and would continue to sculpt until a few days before his eventual death at the age of 89 in 1564, by which time the relationship between man and God was beginning to change. This changing relationship had expressed itself most strongly across the Alps from Italy in northern Europe. The reformation of the church, heralded by the German Martin Luther in 1517 with his publication of his 95 Theses, would eventually end the universal authority of the Pope in ecclesiastical matters in Europe and lead to the establishment of the Protestant churches. This emerging Protestant culture produced its own master most famously, Albrecht Dürer. Born in Nuremberg in 1471, the son of a goldsmith who was also an artist of some note, Dürer began his creative life in his hometown's thriving new print industry, producing woodcut illustrations for books. At 20, he made the first of his four great journeys through Northwest Europe, illustrating books along the way. He absorbed the tradition of the northern artists, which had developed almost entirely independently of Italian influence. Fifteenth-century northern artists, such as John van Eyck and Roger van der Weyden, created works whose beauty derived from careful observation of reality, applied in great detail, usually with the new oil paint technique pioneered by van Eyck. This tradition can be seen in Durer's simple but wonderfully natural picture of a hare. But Durer was also aware of the momentous developments going on in Italian art, and after marriage and setting up his own workshop, he spent a year in Italy. Durer is a very interesting character because although at first glance his works may appear to have a specifically northern character, the time which he spent in Italy and the time in which he was able to study the engravings of Mantegna ensured that the Italian interest in naturalism and a realistic depiction of space and form allowed him to blend two influences to create a style particularly unique to him. His woodcut of Adam and Eve from 1504 perhaps best illustrates these efforts. However, his self-portrait of 1498, more holy in the northern tradition, is for many a more significant work since it proudly proclaims the status of the artist as a humanist scholar rather than just a manual worker. If Dürer was concerned about the lack of status granted to artists in the north, he needn't have worried. His many prints ensured that he became well-known across Europe. When he returned to Italy in 1505 for two years, he discovered copies of his prints were widely available. He was also pleased to enjoy the high status granted to artists in Italy compared to Germany. Here I am treated as a great man, he wrote to a friend, at home as a poor devil. Durer's work from this period, notably his Madonna of the Rose Garlands in Prague, was heavily influenced by the Venetian Giovanni Bellini, and they confirmed Durer's capacity to mix northern and Italian art. He begins to adopt a more sculptural approach. He begins to use shading and use line to create a sense of depth, a sense of roundness, which in spite of his use of harsh line and almost jagged northern forms, allows him to create a greater sense of depth and a greater sense of space within the environment which he depicts. Durer is often regarded as the great artist of the Reformation, 
and his ardent support for Martin Luther is well documented. But although the age of Protestantism was seen by many in Northern Europe as a great step forward for humanity, the Reformation would have an unfortunate consequence for some artists, less work. Many thinkers of the Reformation considered the visual arts to be a form of forbidden idolatry. As their ideas took hold in regions such as Switzerland, the artist's traditional role in painting religious images for churches went into decline. If the artists were to thrive, they would have to find new roles. One such role was that of portraiture, and in Northern Europe, the greatest portraitist of his age was Hans Holbein. Hans Holbein the Younger was um, the son of uh, another painter, and in fact he was trained as a goldsmith. He mostly worked uh, in his early life in Basel in Switzerland. And he produced illustrations for uh, printers. But with the Reformation making life rather turbulent in Europe at the time, he came to London. Holbein eventually became the court painter to Henry VIII and set about producing a series of portraits that capture the spirit of that tumultuous era in English history. The attention to detail, characteristic of the Northern European tradition, can be seen not only in his surviving portraits of the king and his later wives, but also in his images of the courtiers and merchants of the time. Portraits whose elegant simplicity seem to capture the spirit and attitude of the subject. The National Gallery in London is home to one of his best known portraits, the Ambassadors. It represents the ambassador to France in 1533, a man called um, Danville, and his friend who was a bishop called Georges de Selve. And Selve probably came to visit his friend Danville in, in London in April or May 1533. And the painting is a very, very important sort of, it's like saying this meeting happened. It shows what they did when they were in London. And it really tells us a bit about the men who were members of the French nobility, very, very, very high up, and their interests. Because the painting is very famous for the number of objects it represents between these two figures. What we see in the painting are uh, images of globes uh, which show their worldly power and influence. We see books, uh, one of which is entitled uh, Arithmetic for Merchants. We see the latest theological treatise from uh, Martin Luther. Uh, we see all of their uh, ideas within this Renaissance world that they inhabit. And yet, also, uh, what we see is a, a lute in, uh, on the lower shelf behind them. Curiously, the lute has a broken string, which has a, a rather deeper meaning. And the main feature of this painting, apart from the two men, is the strange distorted skull in the centre of the image right on the floor. And the curious thing about this skull is that you can only see it properly from an angle. And it would be seen as if you were coming up a stairs and suddenly you would see the skull in front of you. You wouldn't see it and suddenly there it would be there. So it's a very sudden, immediate response that someone looking at the painting would see. What all of these details are telling us is that um, life in itself is still transient. So that Holbein uh, tells us both that the two people he paints are the members of the very pinnacle of society, uh, but also that uh, they, along with all of the rest of us, um, are mortal men and that life will pass. If Holbein was the undoubted master portraitist of his age in Northern Europe, among Italian artists of the time, that honor goes to Titian, who hailed not from Florence, but from Venice.
Venetian art of the Renaissance period was inaugurated by Giovanni Bellini. I have here behind me a wonderful painting by Bellini, painted in oil on panel. It shows a sacred conversation between two saints and the Virgin Mary. The donor who paid for the painting is shown kneeling in the foreground. It shows the influence of northern painting, particularly in the way in which he's treated the edges with a softer line, and the way in which he's given the landscape great depth and subtlety of rendering. The colors are rich and bright, in keeping with the Venetian tradition of capturing strong light and delicate shading. Born around 1480, the young Titian studied with Bellini, where he absorbed his master's ideas on color and space in a series of large altarpieces. In 1517, just as the Roman High Renaissance came crashing down, Titian produced his Assumption of the Virgin for the friars here at St. Mary's in Venice. It's a monumental canvas and established his reputation as a young man. Now the subject in this painting is the Assumption of the Virgin and this is the moment when the Virgin Mary is taken up into heaven and is reunited with her son as the Queen of Heaven. Now Titian's painting is amazingly dramatic but what's great about the painting is there's this pyramidic movement in the centre of it of the Virgin and the saints who are watching her ascension below her staring up at her so the painting is very very strong and it's just stunningly beautiful bright colours, blues for which the Venetians were particularly famous so the blues and the reds make this painting even more dramatic than it would be otherwise. What Titian then did was he painted a much more dynamic image than had ever been produced before. The prior, prior German of uh, the Church of the Frari, he was expecting a rather calm Renaissance image. What he got was a Baroque painting, uh, but it was a Baroque painting painted a hundred years before the Baroque period actually began. Titian's way of painting is very different to the central Italian way of painting of Michelangelo and Raphael. Um, the Venetians were very, very keen on colour, on texture and landscape, whereas in central Italian painting you're more likely to find strong emotion and movement. And as a result, um, we, don't, we tend to think of the Venetians today as not being as good painters as Michelangelo and Raphael. Like other high Renaissance painters who lived well on into the 1500s, Titian began to play with high Renaissance stability and composition. For his painting, St. Mary with Saints, with the Pizarro family, also here in St. Mary's of the Friars in Venice, he put the Virgin eccentrically on the canvas, placing her to one side. This striking new composition raised quite a few eyebrows, and indeed it led critics to observe that Titian, just as Michelangelo, could have his mannerist tendencies. Despite his fame, which lasted until his death, it's possible that Titian's status as the leading Venetian artist of the Renaissance would not have been achieved if one of his contemporaries had not died so tragically young. Giorgio Barbarelli, known as Giorgione. This is the Accademia Bridge in Venice, and nearby are some of the best works by Giorgione. Giorgione was a contemporary of Titian, though he only lived until his mid-thirties. Nevertheless, Giorgione sees the world through very different eyes than his master, Bellini. The Sleeping Venus is the first painting of modern times to take as its subject matter the female nude set against a landscape. And Titian borrowed the pose wholesale for his own classic nude three decades later. Giorgione and Titian are very interesting artists for the fact that they had the same teacher, Bellini. Giorgione was significant because he introduced a new theme to Italian art. He introduced more 
secular and pagan themes such as love and even eroticism. Giorgione introduced the female nude, which was to be fundamental for the rest of Western art. Giorgione's greatest work, The Tempest, in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Venice, is especially interesting for two reasons. Firstly, Giorgione used a new type of highly opaque oil paint that he had developed. This new paint enabled modifications to be made during the actual act of painting. We know this for sure in the case of the Tempest, because X-rays have revealed that where the soldier now stands, there was once a second female nude. The second innovation relates to the subject matter of the work. If the painting illustrates a story, no record of that story survives. The woman and child in the painting may indeed be a virgin and child, and yet it's highly ambiguous and enigmatic. What we have here is perhaps the appearance of a more humanist sensibility in Venetian painting. The storm that's brewing in the sky behind these figures is threatening, and it seems to place man at the center of concerns. Nature is not seen or interpreted here through Christian symbolism. Giorgione, therefore, is enormously important. He struck up a new aesthetic in painting that involves landscapes and figures in a picturesque scene that is both moving and beautiful at the same time. That the artists of the High Renaissance were able to achieve so much in such a short period of time perhaps gives us as good an indication as any of the vitality of the times in which they lived. The High Renaissance remains remarkable for achieving a more human and a more superhuman image of man. While the politics of the age were far from ideal, the arts in Florence and Rome compensated with awe-inspiring glimpses of a perfect world of grace, harmony, and heroic beauty. In Venice and Northern Europe, the early 15th century presented a moment in which man's most complex emotions were conveyed with clarity and dignity. Inspired by classical culture, the masters of the Renaissance created works which continue to invite and haunt man's most profound aspirations.